Thank you. Dr. Ali Alawi, thank you for joining us. Bismillah, I'm handing it over to you. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, wa bihi nasta'een. Huwa al-awwal wa huwa al-akhar. Huwa al-zahir wa huwa al-batin. La ilaha illa hu. La ilaha illa Allah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. I'm going to give a talk, but not the one advertised, I'm afraid, because that's not the one I was told to give. So in case you're expecting something, you might get something else. So this is a time for you to make a, make a quick exit. So, <laughs> um, my talk is really uh, partly to do with my present concerns and preoccupations, and partly to do with a, a lifelong quest, uh, trying to find the, inter- the interface, the, the uh, connecting thread between the seen and the unseen, or what Sheikh Fadullah says between physics and metaphysics. And in as much as the entire uh, range of human affairs are uh, covered by, by, this, uh, by this reality, the reality that everything and anything has two dimensions, one dimension that points to itself and to its essential nature, and one dimension that points to uh, the one, to the absolute. And it is this play between the absolute and relative, between the uh, near and far, between uh, the singularity and multiplicity, is the pivot around which human existence, and actually not just human existence, but all existence, all entities that come into being are uh, pivoted around this. And not just entities, but events and uh, Phenomena. Um, those of you who know something about me would know that I have some concern with with uh, politics and history and historical processes, especially. And one of the one of the areas of great concern to me is becoming increasingly so. Is that while the, the path, uh, while the way of uh, self knowledge, which is actually just knowledge of the one, you just come back, back, back to the same reality. Uh, seems to be a highly individualistic uh, construct and that the message in its entirety appears to be one in which all of these faculties and all of these potentialities emerge in the individual. There is obviously something to do with community, something to do with collectivities, which is not necessarily the same as the individual. What applies to the individual does not necessarily apply to the collectivity. At the margin, it does. At the edge, it does. A society composed of uh, virtuous, uh, extremely pious individuals may not necessarily be a society that is just and equitable. And although, as Ibn Arabi says, we are all a society within ourselves, we are an an individual kingdom which has its ruler, its its, uh, prime minister, its deputies, its army, its... uh, uh, income earner, all these potentialities exist within the individual. But when they're reflected outside of the individual form, they become uh, social, they become collective. So does the collectivity have a path to salvation? Does, does the collectivity, the community, when it organizes itself, does that organize itself according to eternal laws and eternal truths? Or does something, some other element, some other power, some other set of rules apply? And why do certain communities thrive or groups thrive and others uh, decline? Why, why is there a rise of powers and fall of powers? Uh, why are elements of our, of, of, uh, of our own uh, self-awareness, as it were, connected to the, to the outcome when we operate in groups. Nobody here is immune to the fact that we have these two aspects to ourselves. We have aspects as an individual which has its own rules for 
uh, knowledge and, and recognition has its own rules for coming into being, recognizing all these elements, and then allowing all the obstacles and impediments to fade away. But we also know that we are part of a community. This group here, can we make certain claims about them that you can probably make with greater assuredness and certainty about the individual? And here we have to go again to back to this, the source or the crack out of which indicators and points uh, appear to us. And all the great uh, scriptural texts, and in particular the Quran, which I know better than others, is, is not really a, a textbook of, of history or a textbook of uh, uh, prognoses as to how events unfold or should unfold. It's mainly what it calls a book of ibar, a book of admonitions, a book of examples. It works in symbols, it works along myths, it works along myths in the, in the, in the, in the heroic sense, not in the sense of something that is, uh, that is uh, uh, not possible to conjure into being. And it is there, I think, that we have to find the seeds for the rise and fall of, of groups and societies countries and civilizations and it is there that we have to find the roots and the causes behind rise and declines including the rise and decline of societies that see themselves as good societies or virtuous societies or societies that are combined in iman combined in faith and combined in submission to islam a lot of a lot of what we hear these days that drives these uh, extremists including I might add those who are not necessarily on the, uh, on the armed militant terrorist scale, but those who genuinely believe that there was a community called the community of Ahl al-Madinah some, sometime around the 7th century, during and immediately after uh, the Blessed Prophet's uh, uh, presence on this, on this terrestrial planet. And that community, one way or the other, uh, sorted and solved uh, the problems of humanity. And the ways in which people lived, the ways that they acted, the ways that they, uh, they, that they obeyed, they did their observances, the way that they related to each other and to power, is in fact the ideal community. A lot of what drives the uh, modern day, and not just Salafists, this also comes into the uh, uh, political lexicon, as, it say, as, I would, uh, as one would say, of nearly all Islamic movements, that it is a pining of sorts to an idealized world in which these, uh, these conflicts that, that we see all around us, both at the individual and the social level, were reconciled in some kind of uh, uh, perfected form. This, I think, is a profound misreading, not only of, of history, but also uh, of the Quranic text. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran does talk about collectivities, does talk about uh, societies, and does talk about groups, not necessarily in the same framework as uh, it does about individuals. Most of the Qur'an is to do with individuals, is to do with the, the, uh, the requirements, not only to live a wholesome life, but the requirements to reach recognition at this point of return. And it's directed necessarily at individuals. Do societies and civilizations have that capacity or not, is the question. And that, that question has basically been excised out of, our own, uh, out of our own understanding of our past. We do not understand our past through a uh, calculus of uh, historical knowledge. We understand our past primarily through faith or through uh, doctrine and and uh, dogma. Uh, faith is, is, stands on its own, as a, as, has its own rules, and has its own yardstick of truth and veracity. But everything that comes into time, and everything which relates to time, must be subject also to the tests which time allows, even though time itself is illusory. In the context of terrestrial life, there is a sequence of events which have preceded where we are now. And these sequence of events either do or they do not have a pattern. 
either do or do not lead somewhere. Either they do or do not have a structure. Either they do or do not have some moral purpose. And we cannot avoid these these issues. We cannot avoid these questions because if your deen is, is anchored on iman and doctrine, doctrine is created over a period of time. Doctrine evolves. It did not come down the aqidah that we all talk about, the dogmas that we all talk about, and it, that we take as part and parcel of our um, religious being. These are not necessarily man-made, but they have been unfolded over time. So they must, we must allow them to be subject to the rules that govern anything that unfolds in time. And that, that includes rules that are, unfortunately, far away from the way that uh, Muslims conceive of their, of their origins and of their past. So, am I making what, a plea for, for a historical sense? Yes. I think it's essential. It's essential to know, or at least to approximate in our knowledge, as to how things happened, why they happened, and actually what happened. And if we don't know these things, if we don't know the what's and why's and how's, we cannot make any claim about veracity of doctrines. We cannot make any claim about why certain Sharia rulings are real and true and others aren't, or why different interpretations are both legitimate or some interpretations are not legitimate and others are. are. So the, the knowledge of the past and subjecting that knowledge to tests, to tests of uh, veracity are essential to understanding how these, uh, these doctrines evolved, and essential to understanding also why and how the civilizations that were built in the past rose and fell. There are certain assumptions that we make, uh, both as, as Muslims and as perhaps any religious uh, being. One of them is that, let's talk about human nature. Um, is human nature universal over time? Are we the same people? Do you have the same makeup as those for, of those 1,400 years ago? Do you have the same drives? Do you have the same desires? Do you have the same intentions? Do you have the same goals? Are we the same people? Because if we're not the same people, if we are the same people, then you can make a claim for, for universal truths. If we're not the same people, if, if our perceptions, consciousness, precepts are different, then we cannot make any universal claims. The claims that we make about our past has, have to be claims that are particular. Therefore, we have to see the others as different constructs, as different beings with different drives. So, just to be uh, very... Uh, the Sahaba of Medina in, in the first uh, century of the Hijra, did it, are they the same people as us? Do they have the same faculties? Do they have the same, the same mix? Uh, is their experience valid for, for our times? D- did they consider, did they value, did they valorize things the same way? Now, going back to the Arctic of the Quran, th- the answer is yes, is that there are certain universal aspects, not totally the same, but there are certain un- universal aspects of people's humanity, of people's essential being, that does not change. So one of the building blocks, as it were, of a true, a voracious historical understanding of the passage of, of human beings over time is that in certain essential features, they are the same. There are, of course, others who deny that, and there are, there are entire historical schools that deny the universality or the universal features of human beings. The next thing we have to ask ourselves is that, is there a direction to all of this? Are all these jumble of events, and they're massive. I'm not just talking about Islamic history, it's just world history, universal history. It's a, it's a jumble of enormous events happening over long periods of time in different sequences with, with apparent irregularity, uh, things appear to go in a certain trend only to collapse. Uh, civilizations rise and disappear in a minute. Armies appear to be potent and they dissolve. Or vice versa. The, the 
collapse of the Iraqi army in June of last year, nearly six divisions in front of nearly 3,000 people, is, I mean, it's emblematic of the issue. How do these things happen? How, and it's also in another way, in a, perhaps a perverted way, when the early Muslim armies entered into, into the fray against the Persians or the Byzantines, the, 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 uh, the scale was not that different. I mean, the best estimates that Khalid, Khalid and Walid's armies in Yarmouk were not more than 5,000 people, 5,000 cavalry, against an army of nearly half a million. So why was this collapse? Why did these collapses happen? And what does this imply? Is there an underlying purpose behind, is there an underlying meaning to why systems break down all of a sudden and others are replaced? We have to ask these questions. We have to ask these questions in a fundamental way. Is there a, is there a, a kind, an end to all of this, apart from knowing the purpose and meaning behind, behind the, ac- act, the actions and the activities of human beings over time? Is there a definite end? Do these things end? The, the, the entire uh, universe, as it were, of sacred history demands that they end in a certain way. So is everything trending towards, to use a cumbersome word, an eschatological end? Is everything going to end with a, with a, with a massive uh, uh, denouement, some kind of uh, Armageddon, some kind of end of days, some kind of end of time? Does the modern mind accept that? Do you as Muslims accept that? Or even those of you who are who have religion, who, who are who base their uh, value systems on religious forms and structures, do they accept that this is where things are trending? And if so, how do we find the truth in that? I remember at the turn of the millennium, there was a group of people who thought that this was the end of time, and they all uh, assembled in London, took a plane. For some reason, it was supposed to happen in Albania, and they went up to the top of the mountain and waited, and nothing happened. Now, these people have not lost their faith in the end of time. They just said it's been postponed for some other, on some other basis. You may, you may uh, you know, chuckle at this, but in reality, this is a fundamental element of the way that, that those who, who confirm their, their, their value systems around religious belief structures believe that this is how it's going to end. So, the, this, this kind of end of days uh, understanding of the deen. The liberal mind, or the, let's say the enlightenment mind, denies that, denies, says that history moves in progressive cycles. This year is better than last year. This century was better than the century before. And that all the accumulations that we've had over time have improved the capacity of human beings, both uh, materially as well as intellectually. Now, this again goes goes against the other uh, the other precepts, the other uh, pillars of a religiously or a textually inspired worldview. Of course, sometimes the two are conflated and covered up. It's not very common to find people these days seeing meaning and pattern and direction and end. But. Uh, some great uh, and, and very well-known writers and thinkers, Francis Fukuyama, for example. If you read uh, his text, um, his, the, the End of History and the First Man, or the, the Nature of Political Order and so on, which came out recently. It's a very good book, by the way. Uh, it, it, it's very difficult for him to disguise his, uh, the purposeful end of history, the, the telos, as the Greeks used to call it, of history. And because he believes in the Hegelian system, and Hegel, the great 19th century philosopher, German philosopher of history, uh, said or taught that there is an ultimate direction to all of this. So embedded in all of these, what appears to be liberal, value-free type of work, uh, there, is, there are certain structures. So when we approach our past, when we approach our understanding of the past, we have to also uh, make certain conclusions, or what, is, what are known as a priori conclusions, before you actually enter the fray. You have to make a statement whether these things are true or not. And then you have to relate these statements 
to what you believe is the divine purpose. Because if Allah is the only actor, and human beings have no agency in all of this, then, this, as Henry Ford said, history is bunk. It doesn't mean anything. Whatever you do, the outcome is not under your control. However, if you have agency, and the Quran gives you agency, or the other great faiths give human beings agency in certain scale of action, then you can actually philosophize about history. You can actually make claims about where this is going and where it's not going. The greatest thinker along these lines in our, in our tradition was a man called Ibn Khaldun. You may have come across him. Uh, but unfortunately, he's a singleton. It's like a one-off. Uh, he was sometime in the uh, 14th century, and he uh, ruminated, ruminated, ruminated over these issues, and came up with with his own. I'll talk about that later. But he came up with his with his own version. He tried to squeeze it within the apparent confines of uh, uh, of the Quranic uh, uh, position on communities and their rise and fall. Uh, there are many, many ayahs in the Qur'an about the rise and fall of civilizations and communities. There are many ayahs in the Qur'an about the, the, the cycle, that, as it was like a marathon race, or a relay race, sorry. You hand over the baton to someone else. And that these times in which powers emerge and powers die uh, are finite, and they're governed by certain rules. The question that we ask, we have to ask ourselves, is whether these rules have a form of, of uh, sanctity about them. That is, when the divine, when the sacred, intervenes in human affairs. Does it, is the intervention ever there? I mean, therefore, it is illusory for us to think that there is uh, some kind of human actors involved. Or is it the intervention is according to certain rules? Or is this intervention is according to certain ibar, which are admonitions? Now, the Qur'an has no rules about, about interventions, but it has admonitions. It has what would happen if you don't do this. And there are really a number of very, very important ayahs. The, the key ayah, I think, is, is uh, Surah Al-A'raf. I wish I can read it in the way that the early reciter did. If he's here, maybe he can read it for us. If he's not here, I'll try to do my best. Uh, I'll translate directly into English. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. وَلَوْ إِنَّ أَهْلِ الْقُرَىٰ آمَنُوا وَاتَّقُوا لِفَتَحْنَا عَلَيْهِمْ بَرَكَاتٍ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَلَكِنْ كَذَّبُوا فَأَخَذْنَاهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَكْسِبُونَ أَفَآمَنَ مِنْ أَهْلِ الْقُرَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتِيهُمْ بَأْسُنَا بَيَاتٍ وَهُمْ نَائِمُونَ أَوْ آمَنَ أَهْلِ الْقُرَىٰ أَنْ يَأْتِيهُمْ بَأْسُنَا ضُحَىٰ وَهُمْ يَلْعَبُونَ أَفَآمَنُوا مَكْرَ اللَّهِ فَلَا يَأْمَنُوا مَكْرَ اللَّهِ إِلَّا الْقَوْمُ الْخَاسِرُونَ if only the people of Ahl al-Qara is the people of the villages, but it means nations, believed and were uh, in taqwa, that they were aware, cautiously aware of Allah's commands. If only they had believed and were aware of these commands, we would have opened for them barakat, barakas, the uh, uh, graces from the heavens and earth. But they denied it. So we gave them, we rewarded them with what they, what they had endeavored for. So th- there is here an equation, an equation between uh, a, a, a form of faith and an equation between faith and tuqa, which is uh, cautionary awareness of Allah's commands, and grace. But we don't know how that grace uh, expresses itself whether it expresses itself materially, whether it expresses itself militarily, technologically, uh, culturally, we don't know. It's obviously all of those, some of those, or, or none of those. But there is something called a community in, in, in Iman. So Iman is no longer an individual construct. It becomes, therefore, a social construct. And when we look at the, the admonitions of the Quran, it says, Siru fil ard travel in the lands and see around you what has, what has happened and how what has happened is connected with what had happened and that these things work towards a, a, a meaning, a structure. 
that is another another very very important indicator for us to examine and, and examine our past and examine our our claims and examine our assumptions about the past in ways that are that are meaningful to whatever statements and positions we make now is is the unfolding of events therefore is it the realization in material terms in existential terms allah's purpose or in other words is it the acting out of of god's will or is it as basically one of the the uh, the attributes expressing itself and and trying to encapsulate its its meaning within human form if you look at again some the great one of the greatest philosophers i think of history is hegel and here he he, he in a very very crude way i'm explaining it now is that the entire passage of human history is to do with the realization and the perfection of human freedoms human freedom is the end purpose of all of this and by by freedom we don't just mean political freedom we mean freedom in its all of its manifestations that is every cellular uh, system within you every, every unit within you reverberates in a free way now it's in my mind this is also a form of if you want to call it a Quranic expression of the way in which Allah's will acts out in this world. If you, if you conceive of it as the purpose of human existence on earth is the perfection of qualities that are manifested in human behavior and the, in their institutions, rahma say, or generosity, or forbearance, or justice, that these are all attributes that we have imbibed and as we express ourselves in, in individual action, as we express ourselves in collective action, and as we express ourselves institutionally in, in states and societies and, and governments and, and uh, uh, structures of power and authority, that this is how where it's all trending towards. And I believe that this is the Medina of the Prophet. It's not a backward-looking thing. It's very much a forward-looking thing. It's a society and and a group of societies where these attributes are crystallized in institutional form, in social form. In individual form, that's not a matter. I mean, uh, Sheikh Fadlallah has been talking about that for for decades. How do you perfect the individual qualities in order to become clearer reflectors of uh, the one? And recognize in the process that the the veils, so-called, were not really there anyway. How do we do it on a collective uh, basis is what has exercised me for a long time. And what has, has uh, what is, uh, as Farabi says in Medina al fadila what is the virtu- virtuous city? What is the virtuous uh, nation? What is the virtuous society that Allah promises in terms of the equation between faith, taqwa, and uh, grace and barakah? So is that, is that equation in terms of power? Is that equation in terms of dominion? Is that equation in terms of control? And the answer is definitely not. So the, the noble society or noble societies are those in which human beings allow themselves to express the attributes of Allah socially, collectively, and uh, institutionally in political forms in cultural forms, in uh, religious forms, any form that is subject to the tests of time. So it's a progress. If if you look at it, let's say, in secular terms, in non-religious terms, this kind of realization of the human spirit starts off maybe in ancient Greece, some kind of in the uh, polis, the city-state. Then it moves on to a different kind of uh, freedom, the freedom that the Roman citizen had. Slaves didn't have that, but the Roman citizen did. Moves on to the individual freedoms that came in with the Protestant Reformation. It moved, unshackled the individual from hierarchical authority. And then finally, in the form of the modern civic state, if you want to call it. So I say these days, people ask me, what's, what's, what is the ideal state as we live? I say, I always say Finland. So. <laughs> 
to me, this is the, the expression of perfected freedoms in the modern civic state. But we do not think along these progressions. We, we have to think along lines that are within the structure and purpose of, uh, of the Quranic message. And then, I said before, the what, the how, and the why of events. And these, of course, all require interpretation. Many of the conflicts that we have in our world, and especially in the Muslim world, is to do with interpretation of events, singular events that are seen different ways. I mean, here people are slaughtering each other because he is Sunni, he is Shia, because of one event called Saqifa, Saqifa of Bani Sa'id. What happened within hours after the Prophet's death? People say this happened, others say that happened. And this is 1,400 years later. We still, this is an unresolved interpretation of a historical event upon which entire doctrines and worldviews uh, have been presented. What happened in the uh, conference of Nicaea in the 4th century? If you don't know the details, and it is not, you don't need to know them to debunk them. I'm not talking about critical history that debunks aqidah. But it's a critical history that has to understand the circumstances in which these develop. And with interpretation comes, comes uh, a claim, a claim to authority, a claim to truth. And with the claim to truth comes all the other paraphernalia of institutional uh, rigidities. Language is also critical. Knowing Understanding, I mean, a lot of people say that you have to know the structure of grammar and syntax and this and that for you to approach the Qur'an. But again, small nuances in language have been the cause of, of huge disturbances and divisions. Whether wudu, for example, whether you do it this way as the Shia do or do it this way as the Sunni do is a matter of reading one sentence, only one sentence, how that sentence is read determines the way that you approach your prerequisite before your salat. Now, this may mean, oh, this is incidental. It's not. Daesh kills people. ISIS kills people. If you do it the wrong way, they actually kill you. Because it, it's, it's, it is to them, it is not that you've done something wrong. It's to them you have asserted a falsehood. An assertion of, fal- of falsehood is harb uh, al-rasul, harb Allah al-rasul, and the the uh, the uh, had for that is crucifixion. So these are not these are not uh, these are not uh, uh, minor things that, uh, that that have accrued and have have covered up our, our past. Historical knowledge. Do we have to have a knowledge of history? Do we have to have a a a sense that this is a structure and form that has to be that has to be used as, the, as, as it were the template through which we analyze and assess things. The objectivity of the past. How objective are we when we look at events that have uh, catastrophic consequences or events that have had uh, enormous consequences? Our history is, and human history is checkered, littered with events not only whose interpretations are different, but are seen to be, in their, in their very nature, defining points. And w- we still approach them in ways that are highly, highly subjective. The subjective understanding of, of I mean, I can speak about a huge number of events, but I won't, is critical for us to formulate a position on things. F- not only to formulate a position, but to express knowledge of these things. How, how have these events caused? Were they, what, what caused these things to happen? What allowed these things to happen? So in, in sum, uh, the, the, the study of the past with, with the prism of uh, the, the kind of uh, mapping that the Quran lays out is an essential feature of Perfecting uh, the deen. There's no, there's no question about that. But it's been ignored. It's been ignored for, sometimes for good reasons because each of the approaches that I talk about have been the cause of major uh, fitness, major crises. But you, you can't keep on raising the ramparts 
that protect your, your, your deen, that protect your iman and faith. You cannot do that without uh, taking into account the state of human knowledge at that particular point in time. Because you do it in every other action. You do it in every other arena of life. In every other arena of life, we, we accept technological advance, we take it for granted. We accept institutional advance and we take that for granted. We, we formulate, or we valorize certain, certain, uh, certain qualifications, certain uh, forms in which these are expressed, the way that we, we, we shop, the way we live. We've already made commitments to this form of knowledge that has as its root uh, technology, has as its root uh, uh, certain uh, political practices. So we, you, you can't really isolate that and say that we, 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 can, we have to keep that core somehow intact because if we expose it to the state of knowledge, the thing will disintegrate. If it, if it does disintegrate, it really means there's something wrong with it. Not, not with the core, or the core of the core, the lub bil but the way that human beings have constructed it. So fearing uh, the, what the past can reveal and fearing us posing these questions to ourselves uh, and to, to those who, who teach us and guide us and so on, uh, is, I'm afraid, a, 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 not a passport. You may live an individual life that is protected by by what you think are aberrations, but in the end it would it would fall under the pressure of the accumulation of uh, the way in which people live. So there's a becomes a kind of dichotomy between the way they live and what they what they claim is the way they want to live, and that dichotomy cannot be maintained for a long time, and it applies really throughout. This kind of this kind of reimagining of our of our past is essential to imagine our futures. Because if if we do not bring these faculties into play, uh, again the, the the weight of of the um, I won't say the non-believing world, but the weight of the the denseness of the material world will overpower the subtleties that exist in the luminous world while we live in time. One will just overwhelm the other. We, are, we deflect it here, we deflect it there, but they accumulate in time. So the, imagining the future, not in the sense of conjuring up fantasies and so on, but in the khayali sense, in the sense of reigniting the faculties that allow us to resonate with the unseen. And many people have looked at that in the past, and there are certain sort of uh, systems that help here. That system of, of, of imagining is an essential feature of experiencing the past, especially the remote past. You need that to, to, to move on in the future, but you also need it to put some uh, structure, meaning, substance, and core to events which you have not experienced. So any time that experience is no longer a guide for action and for, and for uh, knowledge, this kicks in, the khayali factor kicks in. And it kicks in in order to creatively interact with what is not known materially. So it is not just for, for, the, for the individual to map out his future or her future. It is for societies to review their pasts also. So the inner senses of, of khayal, of waham, of hiss uh, al-mushtarak, whatever, these are all Aristotelian uh, uh, suppositions. You can expand them or reduce them. I, I mean, they migrated to the Islamic tradition, but it's been going on since the days of the Greeks. These, or more or less faculties, collectively, they are, are the faculties with which we, you, you deal with insubstantiate things. And not just the unseen, but what has actually transpired but cannot be recorded by you. So with these faculties, you please go back to the crisis points in our past and see why these have evolved in the way that they have. What I'm trying to do my, in my own work now, of course you have to write it in a way that is not, you have to exp- in a way that is 
also at some extent acceptable to the modern mind or the postmodern mind. Uh, you can't make assertions these days without without some 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 uh, definitive authority. You can't just say this is the way it is. It may not be the way it is. Others can easily challenge you if you don't have the right tools with which you deflect them. And you can't hide behind any more behind, well, it is the way it is done, the way it's been said. Or the Quran says, you know, do not go back to the claims and authority that uh, were your fathers or your, those who preceded you. You cannot do that. This, these authority structures are no longer there. And if you see it as an ever-continuous engagement, that is the Quran, with the here and now, it's a constant destruction of past uh, idols. It's a process of permanent idol destruction. It's like whacking it on the head all the time, which is an essential feature of any kind of access of true knowledge. You have to keep on breaking, 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 breaking all these idols. So, and this is really no different from the so-called scientific method. As a, or what the economists call zero-based thinking. And every instant creation is, is reordered. Every instant. Ergo, at every instant, the past is eliminated. At every instant. So the history that I'm talking about is, is not the... So I'm, some of you may have shied away from reading it, so boring, you know, 1066 and what happened I don't know, in 1520s or a list of kings and queens and, and some idiot generals and so on. This is not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about an understanding of the past in the form of ibar, in the form of admonitions, in the form of mithal, in the form of symbols, and how these come together uh, in, a, in, a, in a constructive way to elevate the human being and society to reach the equation that, we, that was promised. Uh, the, the, the promised state, the promised condition. And the equation is really very simple. And it repeats itself in various forms, in various guises. Uh, this, is, this is what it is. And to do this, you have to be that. If you don't do that, this will happen. Now, it will happen in ways that may not necessarily... It's not necessarily that a flood that takes away you know, half a million children in China is because they did not believe in Allah. No, this is, not, this, is not, this, is, this is simplification to the point of absurdity. It's not that. This is not what is meant here. It, it, it can be some great things that happen to you, but apparently great things, but destroy your core. Hence, armies collapse overnight, and civilizations collapse overnight, literally overnight. Uh, I mean, you can... You, I talked about it the other day. You, you can mark the rise of civilizations. But you, when you examine the, the decline, especially when you're living the time, they can happen extremely abruptly. Britain ruled the waves unchallenged, unchallenged for a hundred years. Nobody challenged it. The whole world was, was painted pink. In a, in a war, Second World War, which they thought they won, Germany actually won, because they, they collapsed. They collapsed out of exhaustion. It's like a marath marathon runner. Who, what's his name, who, uh, who brought the, the uh, news of the defeat of the Persians in, in the Greek the Persian wars. He, he ran 30 miles and died. So you can, you can do this and collapse <laughs> and just disappear out of existence. I have five minutes left and I shall, <laughs> I shall conclude <laughs> by concluding. All I can say is Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. So I just want to say that uh, just a last word on Ibn Khaldun before I... Uh, the reason I bring him up is because he's always seen to be as a sort of father of social science and he's the, the early uh, sociologist and the father of, of modern history and all that. It's, most of it is not true. But what is true about him is that he was prepared to, to open up files that were uh, gathering dust for, for generations. And these files are, are... And then they were shot immediately after he, he died. The, his tradition has, has been left, uh, 
left basically uh, uh, orphan. So there are there are uh, in our past and in other. Uh, I strongly urge you all to to really immerse yourselves in whatever is the cutting edge of human thinking, and and not just to closet yourself in things that you feel comfortable with. Uh, and rediscovering or re, uh, revitalizing these, these uh, great thinkers, revitalizing the, the way of looking at, at the world, requires not only the philosophical, historical mind of Mukhaldun, it also requires the mind that was uh, encapsulated in great beings uh, that were prepared and to engage with and to articulate their engagement with the unseen. If you bring these two together, if you bring, as it were, the the world of, of Muhyiddin ibn Arabi and the world of Ibn Khaldun and others and put them together, you'll end up with the taking a road that was not taken in the past, but could be the road that would lead to uh, a far more ordered and far more um, peaceful in the sense of salam society. So this kind of equi- equilibrium uh, can be regained, I think, at the social and collective level, while you try to regain it, inshallah, at the individual level. Thank you. <laughs>